Hello and welcome back to the IET Bookshelf with me, Mark Reynard. And our next author and book from the shelf is Femi Faduba with his first book, The Upper World. Now, Femi grew up in Peckham and went on to study quantum physics at Oxford University. The Upper World merges the world of quantum physics with Femi's real world experiences of growing up in Peckham. The book tells themes of free will alongside time travel, as it tells the story of Esso, who discovers his ability to see into the future and becomes preoccupied by the vision of a bullet headed his way. The very same one that a generation into the future is set to change Ria's life too. Honestly, it's an absolutely incredible read. And obviously it is because Netflix is already adapting this into a film starring Academy Award winning actor Daniel Kaluuya. Femi, thank you so much for joining us today. A real pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, cheers for having me. So this is your first book. I mean, a huge congratulations. First book straight into Netflix. It's absolutely brilliant. How does it feel to finally have it out there in the in the real world as opposed to just a manuscript? I'm still sort of getting used to it, but I think I'm more just excited to, to have it in the hands of readers, especially the people who are going to, I think, appreciate the content. The, the most, you know, it's, it's a book about love, violence, and the physics of time travel that just so happens to take place in Beckham. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of people who are interested in, in at least one of those angles. Um, so yeah, just really interested to see what the reaction is and how people uh, enjoy the book. So, I mean, Femi, you know, in your first sort of life, as it were, you are, you're, a, you're a quantum physicist, but have you always enjoyed writing then? I mean, what were you doing before this? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there's a couple couple questions in, in there. I'll answer the first one about sort of writing. Um, the answer is definitely no. Uh, I I learned how to write in order to write this book, actually. So it's sort of almost, yeah, about three years ago now um, when, you know, I, I, I sort of quit the quantum physics theory side of stuff and went into the, the real world of working um, and spent a long time, almost on my weekends, constantly reading books. What, what, would, what would happen, actually, is... Um, you know, maybe I'll be at, uh, uh, you know, having drinks with me or some, some place and people would ask me about quantum physics or relativity. Now I'd give a sort of two to five minute explanation and inevitably, regardless of whether the person was really interested in physics or, or not at all, the reaction was always like, oh, wow, that's insane. Um, cause you know, ultimately I'm talking about things that, that relate to the world that we live in, right? Physics is talk about the natural world. Um, and the question would always be. Uh, where can I find, where can I read more? You know, where can I find out more? And I always just struggled a little bit to find the kind of, yeah, to find a recommendation, to find a, a book that A, they would understand. Um, but more importantly, because there's plenty of people out there who are smarter than me who've written great books on the physics of time travel or, or quantum mechanics. But I think the, the tricky part is giving people a reason to give, give a damn in the, in the first place. Um, and so that's when I got, got the idea that sort of, you could take these concepts um, and wrap them in a narrative. Give somebody a character like Esso, like Rhea, someone who they, they instantly want to root for and, and want to go along this journey with. Um, and, and that would be a great way to sort of almost hide the physics within that as a sort of bonus thing. Um, and so I thought, okay, I've got, I've got to write this thing. It's not, it's not out there. Um, and so I just started reading, reading books about how to write um, and then started writing out, out of that process. Um, and so I actually found it quite fun. I think I'm a bit of a, one of those kind of weird, I'm always kind of, yeah, lifelong learner, for, for, yeah, for lack of a better term. Um, so I found it quite fun kind of just taking on a challenge and I approached, I approached writing probably more like a physicist than a, a scientist than a creative, if I'm being honest, and kind of broke down a lot of the, the systems that work. I mean, writing like almost everything is uh, something you learn versus something you're born with or not. And so that was a, that was a valuable thing to, to learn as well. So, so maybe your next will be how to write a book by a physicist. You know, that would be quite <laughs> funny. <wouldn't it? laughs> you know yeah, yeah. All broken yeah. down nicely in a sort of methodical way. Yeah, so, no, there's an idea there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll have a 10% of that. Um, <laughs> So, 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 you know, you spoke a little bit there about your inspiration, you know, from, from a kind of physics point of view, but yeah. what about the characters? Where did the inspiration from the characters come from? Yeah. So writing is such an interesting process. Um, one of the first books I read about writing was 
Stephen King's book on, on writing. Um, and he kind of gives some very plain advice, which is just sort of like for your first draft, the biggest, um, the biggest barrier is self-doubt. So just write as fast as you can, because the only two words that really matter are the end. Um, and so I went into it and the reason why I'm saying this is because I just kind of wrote and a lot of this stuff comes from the subconscious. So I was just designing this, this character SO and then also um, looking at how to craft Rhea's character and most of it kind of just flowed out. Um, you know, I, a lot, some of it is, is from my life in, in the sense that um, in order to get the voice, um, I both talked the way that I might talk in a conversation um, and thought the way that I might want to think the situation as well. Um, and then just stories that happened to me and people around me. Um, and so it was quite organic. It wasn't a super structured process. It was only when I was editing and trying to improve the sort of ca the character the qualities and make certain things clear that I started thinking about it in a more structured way. But yeah, I think the best writing, the better worst comes from your subconscious, to be honest. And so, yeah, that, that's, that's mostly how it came about. That's brilliant. And, and you know, you've got your characters. What about this idea for the upper world? Where did that come from? Yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting question. I think it's some, this is the kind of book that I think has been in me for a long time, even if I didn't know it. Um, and so that's, this is probably the, the, the upper world in many ways, as, as I describe it in the book. I mean, just so for people who haven't read it, um, you know, you basically have an Esso who's wedged between a couple of different worlds and um, is, has a, a girlfriend, that, I'm sorry, a girl that he's you know, trying to tell that he's obsessed with. And then uh, one day he's running on his way to school and then gets in the way of a, a four by four. He's actually try, in the act of trying to save the kid. He pushes him out of the way um, of this four by four and gets knocked out, not only out of consciousness, but out of reality as we know, um, and into this place called the upper world. And in the upper world, you can see time the way this describes it so his whole life um you know his birth over there on the left and his, his death on the right and everything in between and he catches a glimpse at the end of his day and has to figure out how to to sort of stop it and, and save everyone who he knows and loves um and at the same time Rhea um in a generation later teams up with Esso's older self and they both have the same aim to try and try and stop this um, so I think the upper world is this construct this place um, which is embedded in reality, but also hidden from reality um, and also contains truths about reality, as we see it, um, I think is almost just a metaphor for physics. Um, you know, there's a lot of things about what Einstein says about time, the fact that time travels faster in some places and travels slower in some places, depending on how fast you're going or how strong the gravitational field is. Um, that's not intuitive. Is not sort of what we necessarily interact with in everyday life. And so it's just almost the upper world acts as a metaphor for that, with the physics of reality sort of saying, if we could see life and reality the way physics describes it, what might that look like? Uh, so, now, yeah. now, now, the weird thing there is, is do you see life then in a different way than people like me who, who I'm not a, an engineer or a physicist, I am fascinated by it, but yeah. I don't see it. Do you see, do you think you see it differently? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night. <laughs> I mean, because I think I, I almost struggle with this question. It's a question that I, in some ways, none of us ever know the answer to, which is how does anybody else but yourself experience reality, right? Um, but I do think that, I think that physics does inform how you see things. I have this sort of excerpt in the book where Essel's dad blames, um, talks about how to access the upper world. And he says that it, it's all about language. Um, and there's, there's lots of theories of linguistics about this, this idea that um, the language that we speak, whether that's English, French, Greek, or maths, <laughs> um, informs how we conceptualize the world. And so, yeah, to an extent, I think it does, it does change things. Um, because even something like time, uh, you can conceptualize time using the metaphor of money. I think society in general, does that, you know, people say, I want to, you know, spend time, you know, this costs me time. I have to invest time. <laughs> You're wasting time. These are all metaphors that are extracted from the financial language. And that affects the way we see time. And, and I think it leads to us seeing time as a scarce resource. Um, whereas you could see time as a mosaic, a beautiful mosaic, um, that's sort of a static, but has this 
lovely thing going on over here and this lovely thing over there. And it's more about appreciating the beauty and the meaning of life. And that's what you extract from time. And so I, I, I do think that, I think for the most part, I'm, I'm probably walking and, and feeling the same things you are. Um, but yeah, I think in my better moments, um, physics does provide me with uh, a different view, yeah. So um, Femi, you, you set your book um, and you based it in Peckham and in the upper world, but you spent a lot of your kind of physics formative years, I guess, at Oxford. So was there ever a kind of thought in your head that that would be the, the sort of other setting or, or was it always going to be Peckham and, 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 and the upper world? Yeah, I mean, my, my, my life is, is actually a lot more complicated than the summary you gave um, and something I always struggle with actually sort of trying to figure out how to even describe it. You, did, you probably did a better job than I did. Um, than I ever do, but I think, you know, I, I've grown up in quite a few different places, but Peckham is probably the one that's always been consistent. I moved here when I was, sort of, I think, 10 years old. Um, and there's a part of my book which takes place in 2036, sorry. Um, so that's quite far in the future, and I had to figure, I had to sort of make predictions about the, the future. And so it was useful to have a place like Peckham, which I've seen two decades of change in, to sort of had that as a basis for extrapolating what, what, might, what might come next. Um, so that was definitely one justification. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I, I mean, just almost speaking from the heart, I definitely have a strong connection here in the sense that it feels like home. Um, I think, you know, when I look at both my Nigerian heritage, but also my British uh, heritage as well, sort of just like that kind of combination means that it can be difficult to feel comfortable in a lot of places. I think Peckham is probably one of the only places where you get a lot of people who are equally as confused as me. Um, and it just makes it a really interesting place. It's, uh, it's, if you walk down my lane on any given day, you, you're going to see a couple of things that, that make you laugh. And so just thinking about trying to write a book that was funny, that was actually a big goal of this book to actually have moments that, that made you laugh. Um, just, yeah, I wanted to have a, a, back, a, back, a, a sort of backdrop that would support that quite easily. And, once I made that choice, yeah, there was no going back. Um, Oxford would have been interesting, but I don't think anyone is interesting. Like and I, I think you did that really well. You bring those real world moments in and, you know, someone like myself really feel like we've seen that kind of thing. So it was kind of those moments that you kind of, it kind of brings it to life in a really real way. And yet there's unreal things about it. Um, yeah. Now, you know, there must have been a time when, you know, you suddenly thought to yourself, gosh, I'm really interested in science and physics and maths. And, you know, myself and my brother, very, very different. He's a PhD mathematician. I'm not. And, yeah. um, and we kind of saw things very differently. So when, did, when was that turning point for you in your sort of growing up period that you suddenly start thinking in this kind of slightly different way about how, I mean, you must have started understanding maths in a different way. So when I was a kid, um, I was actually not very good at school and definitely not good at, at maths or science. Um, and I struggled, uh, but there's a couple of things that happened. One, I had this mate who I think I was sort of 11, probably 11 at the time, um, who told me about nuclear weapons for the first time. <laughs> the idea that you have these warheads. When you think about the, the, the atom bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, um, I think that went on to kill sort of more than 100,000 people, like half of that of those people sort of almost instantly um, and the amount of material the amount of fissile material that was actually detonated you know was was probably around the size of this book <laughs> um, yeah. and so just it just bubbled me it didn't make sense that you could have I mean it's also terrified terrified me so it was a little kid thinking that you have thousands of these nukes out there so that kept me up at night um, thinking about it but also just this idea that something that small could produce something that big mm. um, yeah, just, yeah, it's sort of the phrase that always conjures, conjures, I sort of, it's always conjures up for me is something deeply hidden. This idea that within reality, in and around of us, uh, there's something that is hidden, but incredibly powerful. And understanding it, the same way that the, the folks who, who created those weapons understood that if you look inside an atom, there's incredible, incredible amounts of energy. Um, just that, that, that just kind of fascinated me. Um, and it led to curiosity. And I think curiosity is really the, the, the main thing. Once you can get that, that spark in, um, then you're sort of off to the races. Um, I guess I also have to credit uh, a guy named John Carpenter, who 
this is when I was at school. It was actually he wasn't actually a teacher, but I I always always hesitate to tell this story because it sounds really cheesy. And it sounds a it sounds cheesy, b it sounds like I'm up, and c it sounds like uh, something from Goodwill Hunting. <laughs> um, but no, nah, he he was a janitor um, who uh, I think he just I said something maybe about these nukes and he, he gave me a, a physics book um, and I read it and he kind of gave me a couple more and kind of explained a few things to me and my mates thought I was kind of weird for chatting to the ch janitor in, in, in great time. Um, but that initial velocity that I had, um, it was crucial. And I think this applies to anybody, kids or adults learning something to have something to follow up, to feed that curiosity. So that, that was really what built a, a sort of basis. And I would say a lot of things I learned when I was that age, sort of, you know, 11, 12, carried me through all the way to, to, to uni. Because I think physics, once you, especially if you get it young, but I think definitely if you get it old as well, um, there's a lot of things in there. Once you break down that few key, key points, then it unleashes a whole new level of understanding and things become much more, much more easy after that. And it's a, it's a really crucial thing, isn't it? That kind of first person to manage to somehow open that sort of little trap door and, and, and let that sort of information that they want to give you suddenly yeah. have some relevance. And, and, and so, you know, great credit to, to, to John there, who yeah. he's obviously like made a huge difference to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I, I called him up. Um, yeah. And you know, you know how we were all pretty bad at sort of looking back to our teachers and kind of thanking them for, for the work they did. Um, and a lot of it is, isn't really paid for in the sense that they, they don't have to do it. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to have had a couple of people who uh, gave me the time to, to sort of pique my interest and see what I could do. Absolutely. Now, it's a really complex sort of subject for, for people like myself to understand quantum physics. Yeah. But the book manages to uh, to make it possible for, 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 for someone like me, who's not a, a scientist or engineer, to read the book and still be completely engrossed in it without having to have that deep understanding of physics. I mean, there's there's pages in it. I've got some tabs sticking out of the book where I, I put bits in I was going to ask you specifically about. We might get time to come on to it. But there's there's references there to simple Pythagoras' theory. And then you did this great one with the torch explaining, you know, the speed of light. And then you mean, and so it makes it accessible for people like me. And then there's huge equations at the back that, to be honest, I got a bit lost in. Um, that, you know, so how did you manage to make it relevant to all those different audiences? Yeah, I mean, we'll see as well, right? If, if, if people agree with you. <laughs> um, but I think it was my focus is, is the main thing. Um, I, like in terms of like conceptually how I thought about it, I think whenever it comes to trying to explain an, abs uh, an abstract subject, a, a subject that's kind of like physics, which you can't just most of the time just show somebody this is it, um, is you have to A, find a way for them to visualize it. Um, and so that's where it came in, that scene you described where I'm trying to describe the fact that light is always going 300,000 miles per hour, um, sorry, kilometers per second faster than you, um, no matter how fast you're going, whether you're going you know, stationary or whether you're going 298,000 kilometers, still going that much farther. So I use a football stadium example so people can almost see it. Um, and then I think the second thing is giving it stakes almost giving it meaning right and so by taking these physics concepts and embedding them within a story where you have two characters lives more than two but two main characters lives um literally depend on them understanding these concepts it makes the reader a little bit more invested in understanding it too um and then i think uh yeah no it, it's interesting isn't it it would be really fun to see what the reactions are um the, the third step I did was, was just showing it to people who told me they hated science um, and seeing what their reaction is. Um, and uh, the, the, the one the, the time when I realized, okay, I think I've done a decent job here is the fact that the publishing industry, uh, which is kind of, you know, most of the people I interact with tell me that they, they ran away from physics um, and science when they were the kids. Um, the fact that they've embraced the, the book and Penguin has put everything behind it and Netflix believes in it as well. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased with that. So, so, you know, in the world of science and maths, you know, and, and physics and, and, and all of those areas, you know, maths really is known as the language that, that physicists use to describe what's going on with the world. Yeah. Um, you've given us a couple examples, but, you know, can you explain a bit more about how that is? How is maths, you know, explaining what's going on? It's, it's, a, it's kind of a, 
I think when we do sort of junior level maths at, at school and sort of GCSE or whatever, it doesn't kind of give you that understanding that that's explaining what's going on in the world, but you kind of really get that across in the book. Give us a couple more examples on that. Yeah, so you know, I have to say, you know, the, the book one of The Upper World um, focuses on a little bit more kind of Einstein's relativity. Book two is going to be purely quantum mechanics. And those are the two branches of, uh, of physics. Now, quantum mechanics when is all about what happens at the very, very micro level, right? Sort of, it turns out, you know, when you, me and you, we can see each other's faces, but if you zoomed into my sort of the hair on my eyebrow, um, you then see molecules, and then if you zoom into them, you'd see atom, atoms, and then if you zoom into them, you'd see a nucleus with sort of, let's say, uh, a proton, sorry, an electron, for instance. Um, but even well, if you zoom again, um, it turns out that an electron is just made of something that we can't describe in terms of a substance. It makes, there's no analogy I can give you that explains the most, the most fundamental unit of reality. There's nothing I can give you that, that will feel familiar except for number. So quantum, quantum theory is literally based on this idea that uh, at the most fundamental level of reality, things are made out of numbers. Right. I don't know how helpful that was. No, no, it is. It's, I, I'm just totally fascinated about how this kind of language. I love the way you, you know you talk about language. I mean, it, it's interesting as well, isn't it? Because you know a lot of mathematicians are good at languages or are good at creativity because it all connects together. The kind of idea it's a language and it's creative and all those kind yeah. of things. Um, so, what what was the thing that really really caused you the most difficulty when you were writing the book? Was was it that, that, that getting that language across to people like myself who aren't sort of you know well versed in it or, or what was the one thing that really sort of was the big challenge yeah i think the biggest i think the biggest challenge i've faced while writing was probably self-doubt um you know in, in some ways i had the advantage that i hadn't written before there's a lot i think a lot of writers i know have been doing it for a long time which gives them incredible skills that you know i was way behind on um, but it also leaves them with like a lot of expectation where they think i'm a good writer this first page of my writing is meant to reflect <laughs> like sort of Shakespearean levels of talent. Um, and I just knew my, my stuff was, was going to be pretty average and I just wrote the first draft and, and kind of got there. But I think after I did a draft sort of and a half, I started thinking, okay, this is, I got a little bit ahead of myself. This is, this is sick. I sent it off to my mate to read and I said, let's meet up for a beer and just chat through, you know, get, get your feedback. And on my way to go see him, I just opened it up literally in, in, <laughs> like mid transit and I started reading it and I got to the, the third paragraph and I was like, this is rubbish. I just kind of went from, from here, to, you know, to there in terms of how, how good I thought it was. Um, but then I met with him and he said, you know, it's actually like, there's a lot, a lot of promise here. The ending's rubbish, <laughs> change that. Um, but the more important thing he said was just that, look, he said, look, the only thing that matters actually is how you feel in the sense that if you picked the upper world off of the side of the pavement um, and read it, would you say this book is sick? Like if you're being really honest with yourself, would you think it was sick? If the answer to that is yes, um, then it, it probably means that there's a lot of people, other people who agree with you and, and you know, it'll do well. And even if they don't agree with you, um, at least you know you've done something sick and you can be proud of that. And so that kind of freed me up from that self-doubt and it also gave me a bar for which to judge Thing, which is just like my most honest self um but uh yeah i think that yeah i think that that's kind of probably the biggest one. I'm, I'm still struggling with it though self-doubt is something that you kind of have to manage um all the time as a writer so, and it's yeah. interesting isn't it because writing a book like that must be very personal as well so the self-doubt comes about because you poured so much into it i suppose you know and then you know you need those people around you i guess to be honest and, and give you feedback so you can improve as well so it sounds like you had a great network around you yeah absolutely um and i think i think that process of getting feedback is something that you have to be it, it takes a little bit, bit of thought because um, on the one hand, you don't want to release things out in the world too early. I honestly didn't tell anybody I was writing the book. Um, my parents still haven't read the book. <laughs> I, I gave them a copy this morning. Um, and so I was quite caged off about to really mention it. Because, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's certain things where 
if you get feedback too early, it can rock you in the wrong way. But I think once you do have something that, that you know, you, you've done your best on, you do have to get it out there and ask hard questions. Right. Now, is there something in the book that you can tell us that, that, that made it into the book that really happened to you then? Is, is, is it all fiction or, or are there, you know, what's the one thing you would go, oh, that went in the book because of this? Yeah, there's, there's a few things. Um, a lot of conversations. Um, <laughs> it was funny because there's one scene in like, uh, I think it's the first chapter actually, where out in the West End, um, it's Esso and it's a group of mates um, and he's in a situation where you have like one group of like boys and another, another guy comes along and he's like in an opposing gang to the Esso's mates. Esso's not a gang, but he's the people who are affiliated and uh, they kind of surround him and then one guy runs up from the back of the crowd, the whole group, and to the person who they're kind of picking on, jumps over their heads and slaps the person. Um, I remember writing this and my editors came back and said, this feels a bit like sort of uh, marvelous, kind of <laughs> doesn't feel realistic that somebody would jump over. And I, and I, had, and I, I got that point because it does, it makes no sense, but I saw it happen. <laughs> it was like one of my mates who, um, somebody right, literally like, yeah, he was in that situation, the person um, that was in a lot of trouble and it was in West End. Um, and yeah, somebody ran up after a group of boys and slapped them. And I actually had to come in and sort of try and defuse the situation. Um, yeah. Did you think it was going to be this successful? And, and what has that done to your life? Yeah. So no is the answer. Um, you know, there came a point when I was getting near finishing it where I was like, you know, what? I think I've got something unique here. Um, and I felt confident it was good enough to be published. I was at the point where I was thinking, I was almost readying myself for the fight for rejection <laughs> is where I was to say, no, you guys cannot, you can't keep rejecting this because there's actually something here. Uh, that's where I was at mentally. Um, and so to get like, a, yeah, that, that response out the gate was incredible. Um, and the movie stuff, I don't have any experience in it and they made me an executive producer on it. So that's quite cool. Kind of like joining those Zoom calls with Daniel um, Kaluuya and, and um, guy named Eric Newman, um, whose company ran electric, they made like Narcos and, and Bright and other things. Um, and so just learning from them, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting process because now we have people who are actually write the script, adapting it to a screenplay. And so collaborating with them again, is like sort of quite fun and just seeing what they bring to it as well. So you can and it's, it's such a new baby for you as well. And then already somebody's like taking it apart. Is that kind of weird? It is. Weird is probably the right way to describe it, but I think there's two things. One, um, they're like, a, so one, Danny Clear is in the film, so we're going to be okay. <laughs> like, I think no matter what, we're just, they're like, a, so one, Danny Clear is in the film, so we're going to be okay. <laughs> like, I think no matter what, we're just, he's going to kill it because he's the best actor in the world. Um, and two, it's a really strong team. And so, honestly, there's a lot of stuff I don't understand about how the film world works. Like, there's, you know, it's not just as if it's like, if you have a film with bad set design or bad lighting, it, it, it can be a bad film just because of that. And so it just taught me to trust in the team. And thankfully, I have a sick team around me, so. Fantastic. But it, it does record, it, it, it's, it's mad though, it's madness. And I think that kind of movie world is even more sort of, like helter skelter for my sort of more structured brain so yeah it's getting used to but i'm enjoying it though. i'm enjoying that it's, uh, it's just going to be the most exciting, amazing time for you. I can't imagine it. But, you know, you mentioned earlier, this is my last question, uh, Femi, and, and thank you so much for joining us. My last question is going to be, you did touch on it earlier, that already you're thinking second book, Quantum Mechanics. Yeah. That, have you started writing it? Is it, is it already going to be in a film? <laughs> what, what's coming up then in that respect? Yeah, I mean, I can't talk too much on the film side, mostly because I don't know exactly yeah, what the sort of next installment of things would look like. Um, but uh, in terms of the book, I'm really excited about it. I mean, book two is the book I would have written first if I'd had the confidence to write it at that point. And so it's a little bit more ambitious. It's a huge leap. And it's, I think it, it, it actually, the, the physics of it will hopefully actually be simpler than book one, um, but more expansive. So hopefully like a higher payoff for everybody reading it. Um, but I'm excited about the storyline. We basically have, it's a prequel sequel. I don't know if you've seen The Godfather 2, 
Um, but it sort of like straddles the timeline of book one. So you have the events before and after. So you see what happened with Essel's parents, like Blaise Angelique, um, and this other character um, who also appears in the future storyline. And he is somebody who has immense command of the upper world and is after blood um, with only uh, Esso and Maria in his, in his, in his way. Wow. I mean, what an exciting next few months, years you've got coming up ahead of you. Really, a great book, by the way. Really enjoyed reading it. Thank you so much for joining us. We really, really, really can't thank you enough for coming on and, and, and meeting us on the bookshelf. So, um, Femi, good luck with everything. Hopefully we'll catch up for your second book then. That'll be amazing. Yeah, and, uh, you know, good luck with everything. That's all I can say. Thanks so much. It's been fun. Cheers for having me. No worries. Take care now. Bye. <laughs> And five, four, three, two. Well, here we go. We've got the live Q&A. And Femi, firstly, thank you for taking some time out of your diary to join us for this live Q&A. And a huge congratulations, by the way. The book's brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. I've, I've lost it now as well, which is really upsetting. Um, it's up there. I'll grab it in a second. But it's been out now. It's in the hands of the public. How's it going? Yeah, no. Well, firstly, thanks for having me. Good, good to, to chat again. Uh, Mark, um, I think the last time we chatted, it just just come out. So um, yeah, it's been it's been a fun little time. Um, quite busy, sort of doing some press, um, also going into schools, um, doing some STEM work as well. So it's been fun, quite varied. Um, but yeah, getting on with it. And I bet it's been a massive roller coaster, hasn't it? Ups and downs since you know since when we last chatted to now. It you know, the book's out there. Everything must have moved on. So what's been happening? You know, I mean, has the book had good reviews first? Have you have you enjoyed that side of things? Well, I, def I definitely don't read the reviews because um, yeah, I mean, I, I think every author I've spoken to like, do not do it. <laughs> it's just the the view isn't worth the climb. The, the upside isn't worth the downside. Um, and you know, I think there's one of the flaws in human nature is that sort of uh, one bad comment usually outdoes like 10 of them, right? So um, kind of, I, I kind of just don't look at them. Even the good ones, I, I try not to, to look at them at all. Um, but I, I know the sort of averages um, and it's doing really well on, on sort of Amazon and, and, uh, and Goodreads and sort of like above four, 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 four average on both platforms, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and so yeah, no, it's it's been fun, and I I think that the the views that have been most meaningful though is actually just talking to people who read it in person, um, and who felt like passionate about the subject and, and enjoyed it. Um, yeah, that that's been that's been awesome getting that. And and you know, in, in terms of um, in terms of all of the kind of hype around the fact that you've got a, a Netflix sort of uh, contract with this as well, how's that been going? Has that been coming sort of together as well? Yeah, it's been. It's been insane a little bit. Um, I mean, the, the film side of things is, is, a, is a separate track. Um, and so I'm, I'm working, I'm an, I'm an executive producer um, on the film, which should be coming out hopefully next year, um, if not the after, on Netflix. Um, yeah, all the details there. So, so um, one of the producers is Daniel Kalia, who will also be starring in it. Um, and a guy named Eric Newman, company Grand Electric, they make like sort of Narcos and, 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 and bright color films. Um, so we're working together in a sort of a team. Um, I'm kind of, I'd say the third wheel <laughs> that comes in every once in a while. Um, but I mean, to be honest, the, they're the ones who are doing the hard work and, and hold, you know, making all of the difficult decisions. Um, I kind of just every once in a while, you know, say, say my opinion if it's something I know anything about. But uh, the film world is completely different. You got casting, directors, lighting, stage design. I mean, if you can have a great film, with bad stage design and it can become a, a bad film so, so it's kind of a learning process for me brilliant brilliant and, and what about your day-to-day -day life you, you know your normal job are you still doing that what's happening with that are you now full-time authoring how's how's your life going yeah I, i'm full-time authoring now um yeah so it, it, it's been it's been interesting yeah um i am pretty deep into book two uh and so that should be coming out next year as well. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. That's a question we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, I would think, as we go through this. Um, so what else, what else has been happening in sort of, 
uh, in terms of all the, the sort of meetings you've had to go to. You mentioned that you've been going out to schools. That must be a whole new experience as well. Um, what, what's all that been like, the kind of getting out there with the books? Well, we've, we've lost Femi for a second. He's got to disappear, but we'll keep chapping. So if you've got any more questions for us, send them in and we'll, we'll, we'll ask Femi. So don't forget those. I've got them Sorry coming up that, here bro. on my screen. Hey, don't worry. That's fine. We were, we were covering it off, just getting people to send a few more questions in. That's <laughs> fine. That. No worries. <laughs> it's always the way with live in this day and age. You can't lock the doors anymore. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. So I was just saying, you've been out to some of the schools and you said you've met loads of kind of kids. What's that like to be in that kind of situation, which must be all new to you as well? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I, the first time I went to school, I'm trying to, was it Compass? It was a Compass or... The, anyway, it was, a, it was a school in Peckham, actually. So that's quite cool in terms of like going to a school where the book is set. Um, and a lot of them hadn't heard of the book before I came. Um, and, you know, it was sold out at the school. Um, and so it, it was. It was sick, actually. I mean, I hadn't been in a. a I don't think I've been in a school for a while. I didn't realize until I stepped foot into the actual school. I was like, I might have been a teenager the last time I actually stepped into a classroom, um, like properly. Um, and so it was really cool, just like speaking to librarians um, who are some of the most passionate people when it comes to education um, that I've ever met, and just seeing the work that they're doing and the teachers as well. Um, and then the kids, the kids, I mean, it's, it's teenagers, right? And so it's that sort of age where they're, they're, they're smart enough to get everything that's going on in terms of the, the themes I explore in the book, but you also have to earn their, their enthusiasm a little bit. You know, there's definitely that sort of teenage, you know, who, who's, who's cool and, uh, and can react the least kind of competition going on. Um, but you know what? I think, I think we did a good job. Um, we, we, we actually had, in some ways, I, I kind of just uh, went for it. And instead of trying to sort of, you know, almost dumb down the material or almost, you know, call it up or whatever, I kind of, I mean, we, we literally, I start off, started off the, the, the events um, with like a full on interactive math session with the kids where we worked through the maths of E equals MC squared and walk through some things. And so you, I have always had this reaction where I'd start off the talk and I'd say, all right, we're going to do some maths. And the reaction from the crowd always be like, I mean, I've written it. I, I've written it down as one of the questions for today, which was e equals mc squared. I mean, that that comes up quite a bit in the book. And there's the whole section there where you've got the the, the kind of one kilo of nuclear material and how much energy yeah. and that explains. Yeah. And it, it, that blew my mind. And and I kind of haven't really remembered that from back in the school days. Um, and it, it comes out to be like just so many noughts after. It's ridiculous, yeah. isn't it? Um, yeah. So that that's a really interesting thing to start with with school children. Yeah, exactly. It fascinates them, eh? So I mean, they they they, they you take them through a journey, right? Because you know you say we're gonna we're gonna work through this, this stuff, um, and their initial reaction is one of either panic or fear or just like, oh God, not this. Um, and then you start going through it, and they realize the maths isn't that tricky. Um, and then you show them its relevance and meaning in real life. Um, and this kind of mind blowing result. I mean, I, I would ask like a kid to stand up and tell me his weight um, in kilograms and then multiply that by C squared. And then, you, feel, you know, you get all these zeros when it comes to deriving the energy. Um, and then show, and then the final step was showing how much energy they have in terms of the number of Hiroshima bombs that they're equivalent to. It's just if they, get, if they turn completely into energy. And it's just, I think something like 300,000 Hiroshima bombs like a teenage kid <laughs> <laughs> yeah a little bit more for me with the uh, bit, with, with, with the covid weight you know a <laughs> couple more for you watch anyway, so, so look, i'm going to get to get some of the questions coming in we got hey, chester's here loved the book absolutely loved it um curious why the relativity exploration was enabled juxtaposed blended with bullying and violence and was there another vehicle that you ever considered to do that with it is such an interesting question. I mean, I could make up an, a reason for that, um, but I think there is a whole interesting question that even to an extent I'm still answering, which is like, why do we choose the stories that we choose to tell, right? I mean, even, even if you think about, you meet up with someone and you're having a casual chat and they say hello and, you know, 
you then start, you, usually within a couple of minutes, someone will tell a short story. <laughs> um, and it kind of goes back and forth. And so it's just kind of this, but there's, there's a sort of psychology to like, or question of like, why, why did I pick that story to tell? What was I trying to emphasize or explain or hide or emphasize? Yeah. Um, and so, but no, I, th I think for me, there was a physics side um, and the time travel and, and really for, you know, regret and nostalgia um, and the future is, is it can be a metaphor for hope and, and fear. And so it was really just about taking all of those emotions and cranking them up to 100. Um, and I think when it comes to like the, the question around violence, I think I have a, a, a probably a, a particular interest in the subject of, of violence, um, how it, it is enabled um, and, and spread. I, I think, I mean, in book one, we look at violence in a place like South London a little bit, um, whereas I think in, in book two, we'll see that same motif in a couple of different environments. But I think violence is actually um, omnipresent um, and something that's sort of not, not really explained or taken for granted a bit. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to look at that question. And, and I, when I was writing the book, I had also gone through something not too dissimilar to Esso. And so maybe I think probably subconsciously I was trying to answer the same question through the book, so yeah. Now, we've had a couple of things coming in there. Apparently, YouTube lost our video feed for a second there, but we're back on. But they heard us, which is excellent. So, um, But we'll get that all sorted out for the on demand. So if you're going to tune in again and watch this on demand, all the video will be there, apparently. So um, hopefully everybody can see us now. Not that they want to see me. They want to see you anyway, to be honest, Femi. But, you know, I'm here. Um, so, yeah, great, great answer there. Thank you for that. Now, we've got another one come in here. This, this is a little bit more... A little bit more difficult now i have tried sending you this through on on, on the technology i have in the studio here um but it's from coyote adesamoo and uh, it says what can we possibly draw from principles of uh of um quantum in terms of gaining inherent understanding of societal epistemic uncertainties in the four ir going five ar noting dynamic emergent deriving and evolving phenomena including digital technologies and digital transformation now hopefully <laughs> hopefully i've read that out right Femi. so sorry about that but um yeah, th there you yeah. go that's a that's a cracking question it's a cracking question you want to go first i can i can piggyback off of you mark just you, you can <laughs> Um, no, I, don't, I, I don't even know what I asked them, to be honest, Femi. Okay, I have no yeah. idea. I'll leave it, it for you to come up with the answers to this one. It's a tough I'm... one. <laughs> it's a tough one. No, 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 you're, you're right. It's a, um, I'm going to answer this as best as I can, uh, and I'm not sure I'm going to answer it perfectly because um, there's, there's a few things going on in there. And, I, and some of them, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, it's an interesting question. I think, I think if I was to re re sort of put the, the question into my own words, I think what's being asked is, you have this theory of quantum mechanics, right? Which applies mostly to like the, the small scale, right? So when you zoom in to sort of the atom electronic scale, um, the laws of physics seem to behave differently than they do with classical physics. And you have quantum mechanics becoming the, the law of the land. Um, and I think what the, the Coyote, I think his name was, um, is asking is, how can we take some of those, those weird principles from quantum mechanics and use them to understand um, things that are happening at a bigger level, like almost a societal level. I think that the I, you said the IR4, the Industrial Revolution, um, number four, I think we're in number three right now. Um, but how do we understand the different futures you might get, the divergent futures and evolutions you might get with technology and society's application of technology? Um, and is there anything that quantum can teach us? Um, so I, I think my answer to that would, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. I think um, the, the main, the most kind of quintessential principle within quantum mechanics is this idea of superposition, um, which is this idea that something can be in two opposite contradictory states at the same time. So like you could flip, it's almost like the equivalent of flipping a coin and getting heads and tails at the same time. It doesn't make sense, right? It's contradictory. Uh, but within the quantum world, when you look at an electron, you can have an electron spinning clockwise and anti-clockwise at the same time. And it's only when you measure it that it chooses almost, it's not like it has a brain, but it, it collapses effectively into one. Um, and so you only see it going one way. 
Um, but there's things, experiments that they've done to show that it is actually in this superposition state before you measure it. Um, now, I think the main, the main thing I would say about the, <laughs> the question, which says that I'm still struggling with is, is I think that quantum mechanics acts as a metaphor for things at higher levels and not necessarily a direct link. I think taking, because what, what, what do you think about trying to take quantum mechanic principles and, and build them out? Um, you have to take each electron and or do all of the maths for each of those and just aggregate them together. Um, and uh, there are no computers in existence that can do that. Um, you need a quantum computer to do that, <laughs> to figure out quantum at a large scale. Um, and so it's really more about like metaphors and, and what does it show us about um, the way that different things that seem contradictory can evolve. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest thing that quantum mechanics has to tell us philosophically is that um, there are a lot of false choices in life. Um, a lot of times where we think that different parts are contradictory and can't coexist um, and very often do, whether we can figure that out <laughs> or not, uh, or have the language or understanding to explain why you know you have both love and suffering in the world or or you know one approach to to industrial revolution or another so yeah there's my answer wow um and, you know I'd, I'd love to spend a day in your brain it would be a remarkable difference from mine <laughs> but you wouldn't enjoy mine at all i'm sure but anyway um we've got another great question come here in for you femi um for all of your timelines you've got the two sorry your two timelines um you interleave them and it keeps the, the sort of the readers on their toes and this is from from ed uh, but they remain linear so you, you kept them linear um each moving forward in alternating uh, alternate chapters did you ever consider messing around with the timeline so that it would really mess around with people's brains in the book i think we've lost femi so that's uh that question has gone straight uh, to nobody i'm going to try and see if we can't get Femi back on here. So he has properly gone. So we'll just have a quick play with the with the um, the technology and just see if I can't get him back on. Let's see if he pops up any second now. Yeah, we've lost him from our Zoom link here. So just bear with me a second. We'll see if we can't get him back on. But I keep sending you questions. I'm sure Femi will try and jump back on the call as soon as he can. Um, so a few little technical issues today on the live Q&A, which is a shame. Um, but that's what happens when you're live in a studio and someone else is in an office somewhere else. And when, well, when I say studio, we're here in a, in, a, in a back bedroom, to be honest, a little studio we, we've built for these sort of things. Um, so, um, yeah, there's some more questions coming in. So hopefully any second now we'll get Femi back on the line. Um, let me just see if I can't find him here on here. Um, let me just give him a quick message. He might have lost his internet, of course. Let's see what happens. Um, but yeah, so in the meantime, um, if you've got any more questions for Femi, we can always get them over to him. We can post them out as well on in the comments as well on the actual YouTube link there. So uh, if you have got any more questions for us, send them in and we'll keep trying to get them to him. We're still trying to reconnect with Femi. So um, just bear with us and uh, we'll see what we can do. We'll give it another couple of minutes. And if not, we'll have to probably call it an, an end and see where we get to. But uh, just stay with us and we'll see what we've got coming in. There's a lovely question come in here, which is uh, about Einstein's relativity, which I think Femi would have enjoyed answering. Um, but yeah, it's a great read. I, I had a fantastic time reading it and uh, we've enjoyed every minute of, of talking to Femi over the last few months. Um, but so far he's not managing to get back on. Um, so just bear with us for one more second and we'll see what we can do. Uh, right, let me have a quick look over here as well. Not got him coming up there. So, yeah, I don't think we're going to be um, we're going to be getting Femi back by the look of it. So apologies for that. I think his Internet has managed to pack up on him. Um, he might have lost power to his laptop, maybe if you didn't plug it in. Um, but let's not forget as well. We've got some more books coming in bookshelf uh, over the next few months. 
Uh, our next one is the 7th of December, 11 a.m. GMT. So that's 11 a.m. UK time. And uh, that's uh, The Knowledge by Lewis Dartnell. Again, a fantastic read. Uh, and if you haven't read that yet, definitely worth a read. Um, I'm lucky enough to have read that already as well. Um, but yeah, have a look at that one. That's The Knowledge by Lewis Dartnell coming up on the 7th of December at 11 a.m. And uh, yeah, we can't get hold of Femi at the moment. So look, we'll, we'll call that to a close for today. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, keep 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 coming back for the bookshelf it's a great great sort of little review um series we've got going here and like i say we're back here on the 7th of december so thanks everybody for joining us apologies for losing femi in the middle there but um we've we've probably waited enough time now um so uh it's goodbye from me and i'm sure femi would have liked to have said goodbye as well see you next time minutes there Femi I couldn't do it any better um, I did my best and we've got you back that's brilliant oh crikey I'm, I'm in a hotel in West Africa and the, oh, the Wi-Fi just uh, anyway sorry we, we thought as much we thought let's as go, much let's go, let's go, let's go. Sorry, well look yeah. it's 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 brilliant getting you back absolutely fantastic well look we'll 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 on the actual finished thing that we put up then out there we'll cut that bit off and we'll edit all this back it'll look amazing don't worry about it but for the live bit here we have got some more questions for you so uh look quick one coming in here um we've got a question when did you first realize that you could see the world in a mathematical sort of physics type way yeah, I mean, I, I should be clear. I'm, 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 I'm not Neo. Eh? It's not like I walk around and just sort of see numbers every. <laughs> I think I mostly process the world the same way as other people. I think, I think where it comes in is really just pattern recognition, um, where you start seeing the overlaps in patterns, um, just more and more in life across different things, um, and it, it becomes an almost instinctual thing. Um, I mean, you, there's, 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 there's plenty of people, I think, who have this mathematical intuition. If you think about like a, a game like football, um, I remember going, I, was in, I went to Barcelona once on holiday and I saw, I got to, I had the pleasure of seeing uh, Lionel Messi play at Lee Camp. And this guy, because when you watch him on TV, you see all of the highlights and he looks like he's just all over the place. In real life, he is the laziest footballer you could ever imagine. He spends the entire time just strolling. Um, and then every once in a while, he would just, you just see like almost like a, his eyes just light up and everybody else on the pitch doesn't have the same reaction, but he does. And he can just spot something. It's like a pattern that he sees. And then all of a sudden he just starts jogging and he starts sprinting and the ball will come to him and he scored, he scored three goals in the game that I watched. And so I, anyway, I think it's, it's the, but the, his gift there is really being able to recognize patterns. Um, and in this, I mean, in football, they, they actually literally geometrical patterns right um but i think that it applies to a lot of other things as well and as you learn more and more maths the more and more patterns that you build into your repertoire and then you can use you can sort of make those connections and even every once in a while use them to predict what's going to happen a step ahead but, but do you think that everybody has that ability or or you know do some people just not have that ability to sort of understand maths to that level and to see those patterns can you can you really teach it or is it something that someone has to have the natural ability already so i mean i should first of all say i'm not like a a, a neurobiologist or anything like that so you know and, and i know that there are people with specific conditions that make these things quite tricky um or trickier but i think even in those cases it's a bit of a continuum my, my, my general view is that it is something that you know 90 at least 90 percent of the population can learn like learn mathematics to a very high level not everyone in the world is going to be einstein just because you know there's, there's different uh, there, I think there probably are some slight differences, but I, I do think that pretty much everyone with the right conditioning and who, you know, if they, especially if they had good teachers or not um, early on, um, could, could have all done mathematics at university if, if that was their choice. Wow. Um, and so it's really, I mean, like it's, it's like anything, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's 
it's, it's building that curiosity um, and attaching some meaning to it. I think a lot of people don't uh, get, I, I think a lot of people don't dig maths because either they don't, they can't see what's going on um, or there's no meaning attached to it. It seems completely pointless and abstract. And I think a lot of the point of this book was to provide a visual to a lot of the maths and physics. I mean, the upper world literally is a, a metaphor for four-dimensional space-time, right? It's a way that you can see this principle that you'd otherwise have to endure through, equa <laughs> through looking at equations. Um, and then I think the other thing was, uh, is, is meaning, right? Sort of like you, the upper world doesn't just exist as like a, a construct. It, it matters to Rhea and Esso. Um, and so you're also more invested in learning more about it. Um, so that, that's really the, the trick I was trying to pull off a little bit with the, with, with the book. Um, but I think the other thing, the reason why I'm so convinced on the, on maths is just because I, I started out when I was younger, I was really bad at maths. Um, and I was just very lucky to have, uh, it wasn't even a teacher, it was actually a caretaker at my school who kind of saw I had some potential interest and, and, and kind of fed that curiosity. And then I became good at maths. And so I, I've gone through that thing that I think a lot of people doubt exists if that makes sense yeah no totally it's 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 sort of it's one of those things i would you know i'd love to go back and kind of do it all again and really get my head around it but it's just when you hear people talking about how patterns and maths and how you can see things i mean and a lot of people say don't they that uh, i don't know whether you are musically quite often people who are really good at maths are also very good at music because of the patterns and the repeats and right. and that knowledge of understanding how things go together is 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 often together or art even a lot of mathematicians are often yeah. good at arts you know yeah it's interesting isn't it i mean i think it's it's the patterns and also thinking in abstractions right sort of um being able to think through things that you can't see and touch and feel and maths is like this whole language um that exists in an abstract way that you know if you're very good you can go really deep into this kind of like down the rabbit hole um but I think, you know, poets do the same thing. I mean, I think when you're talking about emotions and love and hate and all those sort, sorts of things, those are also abstractions that we've created to describe things, you know, almost like metaphors for things in the real world. You can't touch love, you know, you can't sort of see hate visibly. Um, but we, yeah, so I, I, th I think it's abstract thought and we're all, cap we're all very, very capable of that. Maths just demand a bit more structure um, in the way you do that. Brilliant. Now, we did have a question that I was asking you before we lost everything, um, which was um, you, 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 you weaved when, when you wrote your book, you've kind of you've done it in a sort of obviously different different chapters for different sort of things that are going on uh, and they go through in a linear way, um, but but not. Um, uh, but was there ever a thought of kind of doing it so that the chapters were more juggled up and so that it would blow your mind completely in terms of time and what was happening? <laughs> Oh man, I you know what? I, I don't think I had the, the guts to do that. You know? <laughs> I think to, to honestly, I, bet, I mean, if there's anything, um, the, the requests have been to sort of, you know, could I could I simplify the story even more than I I, I attempted to? Um, and so I could have done that. I mean, that's sort of like um Slaughterhouse Five. Um, I'm not sure if anyone caught the Slaughterhouse Five. A reference to the book i think there's one line where you know it says and so it goes <laughs> um but yeah no in in in, in that book um he, he jumps back and forth um but i just felt like i would lose too many people yeah and okay earlier on we're, we're, we're getting close to the end now but earlier on and thank you for getting back on that was brilliant by the way um uh, earlier on you mentioned that you're deep into your second book now so you're full-time yeah. authoring you're doing all that When's the second book out? You know, uh, how far into it? It, it? Just tell us all about the process. What, what's been happening with that? Yeah, so um, the first book was about relativity. Book two is going to be about quantum um, physics. And so the goal is that, you know, once you read both books, you actually have uh, a view across both the, the two. Those are the two major fields of physics. And so you'd have actually a pretty decent understanding of, of physics. Um, theoretical physics as we, as we understand it right now. Um, so yeah, anyway, I'm delving into the quantum side of things, which I'm excited about, um, and it's a prequel sequel. And so we look, we kind of meet uh, the characters, Rhea and Esso, where we left them in book one, um, and Rhea's on her way to uni, so she's got a few interesting challenges there. 
Um, and then also, she, yeah, there, there's someone arrives um, wanting her head. <laughs> so that's another thing thrown in the mix. And, 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 get, and is it going to be set in your university that you went to, or are you moving away from just following your own life story along? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's not set in my university. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, like, I, I think with all of these stories, it, it's it's a weird mix, right? So um, I think there's most of the details, a lot of the details of Esso's life, including like, you know, where he went to school, et cetera, aren't, aren't mine. Um, but I think I, I I kind of put myself into my stories usually as a way of cheating um when because it's just easier to write stuff sometimes um that you get versus like having to imagine it from scratch um but yeah it's anyway Rhea, yeah she's, she's got some some similar challenges to some things i face but a lot of different ones um yeah i, I didn't have a, anybody trying to sort of murder me when i was <laughs> 18 years old um with, with with upper world powers where she'll have to face that um, yeah, and then there's a prequel as well. So we, we go back to, to West Africa, and um, which is why I'm here right now, actually. That's what I was going to ask you yeah. next is, yeah. what are you there for? Are you writing? Are you, are you holidaying? Yeah. Are you seeing family? Well, what are you doing back there? Yeah, a couple of things. There's family. My sister's an artist, and she's got a show um, in Lagos, actually, tonight. So I'm, I'm going to check that out. Um, and then um, I'm hoping to get to yeah, do some more research on uh, the kind of the region. Um, so the prequel will, t will take place in West Africa, mostly in Benin, um, and look at the generation before. So Blaze, Angelique, and then someone new. Brilliant. Brilliant. And, and yeah. you just mentioned there, your sister's an artist. So yeah. we were yeah, only second ago, yeah, we were yeah, saying, yeah, there yeah. you go, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. And, and does she love maths? Yeah, she was actually a pretty good, like, mathematician. Yeah, she was, she was more into, she was into, into chemistry. So yeah, it's, you know. Exactly. Potatoes, potatoes. Well, listen, Femi, you know, I think that's all the questions we've got through now. So I can't thank you enough for getting back on and jumping back on. And we managed to salvage the live feed. Yeah, so no, that's I'm brilliant. So sorry for all of that madness. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I tried it's, to it's, have a backup plan, but that one failed as well. It's, it's, well. it's just to keep me on my toes, really, in my old age. That's what it is. <laughs> I love it. You know, there's nothing yeah, better than a bit of life. You're, all, you're always ready, though, Mark. You went straight back in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so a lot of fun. brilliant. Well, look, you know, good luck with everything i hope the film you know goes well the book is obviously going to grow massive i'm sure it is um and uh and and, and we hope the second one is as easy for you to write as the first one and it and it sings out there but thank you so much for joining us we really appreciate it and uh and hopefully when the second one comes out we'll have you back on here and see you again and i'll see you on the red carpet for the netflix launch yeah i'm there <laughs> Excellent. let's make it happen thanks so much i enjoyed this Thank you ever so much. And that's it from all of us then. So uh, take care to next time. And I think it's the 7th of December for the next one. See you then. Cheers, everyone.